with a drought declaration by our governor and uh, with some very, very serious water resource issues, turf grasses are often targeted. But I like to start out this conversation by just discussing a lot of the benefits that grasses have in our landscapes. There can be this misconception that they use excessive amounts of water. I think a lot of that can be addressed with a lot of the information that I'm gonna share with you today. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I'm Candace Shively with Utah State University Extension and the Center for Water Efficient Landscaping. And these monthly webinars are brought to you by CWELL, USU Center for Water Efficient Landscaping. And this is our fourth year hosting these webinars. And we've covered a lot of different topics. And I'm, I'm pretty excited for today's topic considering the time of year and most people have a lawn that they're, they're itching to start watering. So we're gonna get back to basics and hopefully give homeowners um, some tips to get them off to a great start this watering season. So we are fortunate to have Dr. Kelly Cope with us today. She is our USU Extension Water Conservation and Turf Grass Specialist, and she's gonna pass along some water saving tips and resources. And hopefully we'll get to answer all of your questions at the end. Well, thanks very much for the introduction, Candace. It's a real pleasure to be with you all this afternoon. And um, I noticed a lot of familiar names scrolling by on the chat. So I'm especially happy to see those and uh, welcome everyone to the webinar. Um, so Candace has asked me to address some basic lawn watering information um, and I'll be doing that uh, this afternoon. Let's see. I got to make sure that I can scroll correctly. There we go. Uh, but before I get started, I, I just want to maybe address the elephant in the room a little bit, which is um, the idea of irrigating turf grasses at all. Uh, because I would say that, you know, especially when we're in a condition as we are right now in Utah with a drought declaration by our governor and uh, with some very, very serious water resource issues, turf grasses are often um, targeted, I guess I would say, as, as um, a use of water that isn't productive. Um, we're not eating it, of course. Um, and so there, there is a misconception out there that spending, I'm making air quotes there, spending water to irrigate grasses is um, not the best use of our water resources. But I like to start out this conversation by just um, discussing a lot of the benefits that grasses have in our landscapes. And, and these are just a few uh, that you see there, but like every plant out there, they produce oxygen. Um, they also store carbon, which is a big concern with uh, climate variability these days. They help to reduce cooling costs around our buildings and our structures, stabilize soil, absorb nutrients. Um, they just perform a lot of terrific ecosystem functions. And so while um, there can be this misconception that they are they use excessive amounts of water, I think a lot of that can be addressed with a lot of the information that I'm going to share with you today. But I do like to start out talking about some of these benefits that we get from um, grasses in our landscapes. Now I'm going to spend some time and I'll try to, to keep it light on the technical stuff, but I'm going to spend some time talking about turf water use and physiology today. Um, I'll talk about optimizing that water use with management practices, irrigation scheduling, and then just a little bit of information at the end about turf grass trialing programs, which we participate in extensively here at USU. So I want to introduce those to you as well because they can be a tremendous resource for identifying species and varieties of grasses that are inherently low water use and have wonderful color and perform great ecosystem functions for us in the landscape. Now, of course, I think we're all very aware that we face water resource issues here in the Intermountain West. We've got growing populations. Some of the most quickly growing um, cities and towns in the country are in our region. Um, we're de dealing with climate change situations, which for us tends to mean reduced precipitation, particularly in the form of snow. And there's competition for water resources, whether it's for um, maintaining water for in-stream flows or supporting uh, endangered species or 
whatever the case may be, there is a lot of demand for water resources in our region. And of course, we here in Utah, we know we're the second driest state in the nation. Um, and uh, we simply do not have a lot of natural precipitation to work with. Now, in terms of water and turf physiology, it performs a lot of functions in the turf grass plant. It transports nutrients through the plant. It helps keep, keep cells turgid or rigid. rigid. Um, it helps the grass to cool itself through opening stomata and transpiration and a number of other things that you can see there. It's, it's simply critical for the function of the turf grass plant. And um, I also wanna just touch on turf soil and water relations because they also relate to the overall um, turf grass water use. And we know that carbon dioxide is necessary for plant um, processes like any plant and plants take in carbon dioxide and use it for various processes. Um, there is some water loss during that carbon dioxide uptake. Um, and then there are other plant parts, such as the roots, the stomata and guard cells that all have roles in um, turf grass water use. And then the water within the soil can then move from soil through the plant in response to physics, essentially. So there are different water potentials in the soil um, and the plant and the air and the atmosphere. And that is what moves water through that entire system. Now, when we're trying to meet turf grass water requirements, there's a few things I want you to keep in mind. Um, probably the first is that depending on the turf grass species, it's going to have different water requirements. Also, depending on the function of the area, it's going to have different water requirements. I've, for example, been having a lot of talks recently with parks managers, um, with cities, uh, with sports field folks, and depending on how the grass is used, it can have more or less water requirements simply to keep it functioning in the way that it's intended. And of course, where it's located, the climate in that location is going to have a big bearing on water use as well. Um, something you're gonna hear me talk about quite a bit today is evapotranspiration. And that is simply the amount of water that is lost from the soil turf system into the atmosphere from evaporation of water from the soil surface and transpiration of water through the plant. So I like to compare it to what humans do when we sweat. You know, we sweat because our bodies are cooling themselves and plants transpire for the same reason. So um, we use evapotranspiration numbers to guide our irrigation uh, quite a bit. So I'll talk about that. I'll talk about relative drought tolerance, and then different management practices that relate to turf water use. Now, there are, of course, a number of different turf grass species out there. Um, you can see them listed here on the left. These are some that uh, are commonly used in the state of Utah uh, and regionally. And I don't want you to get too bogged down here. I just want to point out the differences among them. So depending on which species we're discussing, the water requirements are going to be different, the fertility requirements are different, all of these aspects of management are going to be somewhat different. And so it's helpful if you're trying to determine how to manage these plant materials um, to get to know a little bit more about them. And this again is just to illustrate how different they can be in terms of uh, their requirements. Now, we often use, as I said, evapotranspiration to guide our irrigation practices. And I want to um, give a shout out to our, coast, our host, Candice, here, because uh, I was able to collaborate with her on a fact sheet that she wrote last year that talks about evapotranspiration. So one thing I would recommend, if it's not a concept that's very familiar to you, um, I'd recommend you have a look at this fact sheet. There is the uh, link to find it below, um, but it discusses evapotranspiration. It discusses resources that are available to you to determine evapotranspiration in your area. Um, but again, we're just talking here about the movement of water through the soil uh, turf system in this case but evapotranspiration can be used to guide our irrigation. And I'll talk more about that. 
So getting back to different species requirements for a minute, um, they have inherently different evapotranspiration rates. And so what you can see in this slide is that depending on whether the grass is a cool season grass or a warm season grass, um, depending on its inherent genetic capabilities, it's going to have different rates of evapotranspiration. And generally speaking, our cool season grasses have higher rates of evapotranspiration than our warm season grasses. And so warm season grasses may have very low rates of evapotranspiration. Buffalo grass would be the lowest in this case. Um, cool season grasses would have higher rates. So for example, that's where you see Kentucky bluegrass, um, creeping bentgrass, tall fescue as well, very high rates of evapotranspiration. So again, having some understanding of what species it is you're working with and its relative evapotranspiration rate can help you be much more efficient in your irrigation. Now, another big difference among the grass species out there is the relative drought tolerance. So in the previous slide, I showed you that Kentucky bluegrass has a relatively high rate of evapotranspiration, but I also want to point out that it is, it does also have some drought tolerance um, as compared to some of the other cool season grasses. Warm season grasses also have varying levels of drought tolerance. So having some understanding here can also help to um, help you to be more efficient in uh, irrigating these grasses and also have some understanding of how they can recover from drought conditions. And I'll talk a lot more about this uh, towards the end. So I'm going to spend a little time on management practices now. Um, first, I'd like to just mention turf grass establishment. And, you know, this is more for folks who may be starting from absolute scratch. But I do like to mention and emphasize that if you can work and um, make an effort to have a quality establishment of grasses right from the start. That's going to help you long term as far as improving the water holding capacity of the soil that that grass is planted in and making sure that it thrives. And we do have a couple of fact sheets on this topic um, that in the state of Utah anyway address the differences among the northern and southern parts of the state. But this is something to really um, consider because it can have a huge bearing on water use later on once the grass is established. Now I'll move on quickly to mowing, which you may not have thought about very much in terms of how it affects turf grass water use. However, it does it affect turf grass water use in a big way. Um, in the image on the left, what you see is grass mowed at different heights ranging from one to three and a half inches. And below ground, those are the roots. And you can see that they range anywhere from two to three inches in depth to as many as eight or 10 inches in depth. But what I want you to recall from that is that the shorter you mow the grass, the more shallow the rooting depth is. And so over time, that is going to put the grass into a much more water stressed situation simply because the roots aren't able to access moisture further down in the soil. And so if you can be more on the high end of that scale, three and a half inches or even more in some cases, that is going to encourage deeper rooting, which means that that turf can access soil moisture much deeper in the soil profile. And that is the situation that you want to try to achieve. Now you can see here on the right some recommended mowing heights and that is also very species specific. Um, some of the grasses that we recommend can be left unmowed, buffalo grass and blue grandma, for example. Others we would recommend mowing, um, but always going to the higher end of that scale for these uh, different species. And of course, you know, particularly if you're a homeowner, um, you're going to have some limitation based on your equipment. I guess that's true for any landscape manager. Um, so you're going to have some limitations based on your equipment. But for me, for my purposes, uh, what I do is I've got my mower. I just put it on the highest setting and that's what I go with. And for me, that's about three and a half inches with my particular mower. But take home message here is that you want to be on the higher end of these ranges that are recommended. 
couple of other thoughts on mowing height, especially as it relates to mowing frequency, because this is another thing, the frequency of your mowing that can actually really impact the turf grass water use. You want to keep it high for the reasons we discussed. Um, and keeping it low, in addition to reducing rooting depth, is going to uh, create other issues. Uh, other potential issues. But if you keep the higher mowing height, you're going to have increased water use efficiency overall because of that better rooting mass and depth. Um, so the idea here is you're trying to strike a balance. You want a mowing height that is going to encourage deep rooting, um, but you also want to minimize the leaf surface area. And so what that means is that you want to mow higher and more often if that is practically possible for you so that you're removing a small amount of possible leaf tissue each time you mow as possible. So that is the recommendation with mowing higher, but more often when that's practically possible. Now, moving on quickly to um, fertilization. Fertilization is another management practice that has a huge bearing on turf grass water use. So I'll spend a little bit more time talking about that. Fertilization definitely increased, or rather influences turf growth and water use, but we often do fertilize our grasses because our native soils, particularly in the Intermountain West, do not have a lot of inherent nutrient supplying capacity, especially where nitrogen is concerned. Um, at the same time, if you apply too much nitrogen, that can create another situation where um, it's actually increasing water stress for the turf, but I will get into that more in a minute. So there's a considerable potential for manipulating turf water use with fertilization. Um, and I'll talk about that uh, now. Keep in mind that with turf grass fertilization, particularly fertilizers that are high in nitrogen, um, if you increase that nitrogen application, it will in fact increase water use. And to a point, that is a fine thing. Grasses have a requirement for nitrogen and we try to meet that with fertilization. And so we can, what we're trying to do there is get to the point where the grass is able to utilize all of the applied nitrogen and not more than that. And you don't want to be applying more than that because what happens if you go beyond that critical or sufficiency level of nitrogen fertilization is that that actually decreases and suppresses root growth and increases top growth or leaf growth. So you have fewer and fewer roots growing to support more and more above ground leaf tissue. And that situation with excessive nitrogen fertilization actually puts the grass into quite a bit of stress because it's working to supply water to all those leaves, but it simply doesn't have the rooting capacity to do so. So that's where soil testing can be very helpful, following local guidelines, especially through your, um, your particular land grant university recommendations is really important so that you're not exceeding the actual requirements of the grass. So really avoiding excessive nitrogen fertilization. Now there are some other nutrient considerations. Um, if potassium is adequate, that can really help with drought recovery. Um, in combination with nitrogen, phosphorus can help with drought recovery. Iron, especially in this part of the country, can be very, very helpful because our soils tend to have their iron bound up quite a bit. And so some of our grasses can actually look as though they're, they're showing drought symptoms, but may actually be showing iron deficiency symptoms. So that's something else to consider. Um, another recommendation that relates is uh, returning grass clippings because they actually contain quite a bit of nitrogen and their organic matter can also help to conserve water in the soil. Uh, and the last note I guess I'll say on nitrogen is that um, the fall application of nitrogen fertilization is really, really, really important for the following growing season in terms of um, the grass tolerating drought stress. So that's one to emphasize if you are having to make decisions about um, when to fertilize. Okay, now this is where I really wanted to spend the bulk of the time and, and that's on irrigation scheduling. Um, 
Irrigation scheduling, just a couple of general thoughts first. Of course, we recommend changing your irrigation schedule over the course of the irrigation season. And I'm going to talk about how that can happen in different ways that you can do that as I go on here. Um, but one thing I did also want to mention, we have been, we, and by that I mean the Center for Water Efficient Landscaping, we have been coordinating our messaging this year um, in light of the, gov the governor's drought declaration with our state's Division of Water Resources and cooperating on this Wait to Water campaign. Um, and that's the actual QR code right there if that's something you want to take a quick shot of and have a look at. But um, the Wait to Water campaign that's being put on by our state's Division of Water Resources is encouraging folks to wait till as long as possible, you know, waiting as long as possible in the spring before irrigation can help encourage deeper rooting before you do start irrigating. Um, and that is one very, very basic recommendation for irrigating turf. There are other technological aspects to irrigation uh, with controllers, there are rain shutoff devices, frost, wind shutoff devices, things that will interrupt irrigation when con conditions are not good for irrigation. Um, we also make the general recommendation to water less frequently and more deeply. However, I would also say that after <laughs> being in this game for, I guess, about 20 years at this point, um, that's an aspect of irrigation recommendations that we are starting to look at a little more carefully, particularly in the warmer parts of the state where it may be that irrigating more frequently and less deeply is more appropriate. So that's why I have the asterisk there. That's something that we are starting to look at a little bit more carefully. Um, other general recommendations include cycling the irrigation. So for example, if you intend to irrigate for 15 minutes, irrigating perhaps for five minutes, waiting an hour, five more minutes, waiting an hour, and then your last five minutes. That's cycling the irrigation so that you allow that water to infiltrate um, and avoid ponding or runoff. And then matching the application rate of sprinklers to the soil's infiltration rate. I'll talk more about that. And considering temperature and wind. So I have a lot more to say about irrigation, but these are some of the basic ideas that we keep in mind. Um, with irrigation recommendations. Now, there are some um, what I'll call low tech solutions or fixes for uh, optimizing turf grass irrigation. We, one of the things that we focus on a lot with our programs is minimizing overspray, minimizing the application of water to things that don't need water, for example, streets, sidewalks, driveways, um, mulched areas. Um, checking water pressure because of how important water pressure can be uh, for the efficient application of water by sprinkler heads. And sprinkler heads are designed to operate at very specific water pressures. And so if you are outside of that range, it can really decrease their efficiency. Uh, compensating for wind, um, that is something you can take a couple of approaches with. Uh, on the front end, when irrigation systems are being designed and installed, if you know that you are in a particularly windy area, that might cause you to space your sprinklers more closely to address that wind condition. Um, on the other hand, if you're working with a system that's already been installed, you can compensate for wind issues by determining which time of day the wind is the least and irrigating during that time. Now, that just brings to mind another thing that might be a little bit controversial out there, and that is that um, there has been for quite some time uh, some guidance out there about avoiding irrigating during the heat of the day. But there is some very, very recent research being conducted here at USU looking at time of day irrigation and what the preliminary findings are actually showing is that irrigating during the heat of the day is not necessarily going to cause you any more water loss than certain conditions at other times of the day. And so those findings aren't complete. That study is not complete yet, but I think we are going to be revising our guidance on that. And so when I say to compensate by with 
compensate for wind by choosing a time of day to irrigate that's less windy, I feel comfortable in saying that even if that might be during a warmer part of the day. Other things in terms of low tech solutions that are going to help improve um, irrigation of turf grasses include routine maintenance. So having a look at the irrigation system in operation during the daylight hours so that you can identify problems like clogged sprinkler heads or nozzles, um, sunken heads, uh, tilted heads, um, all kinds of things like that. So fixing those problems can really improve the ear efficiency of your turf grass irrigation. Uh, so those are sort of, those are on the lower tech side of things, but I do want to focus on some of the higher tech solutions that exist for improving irrigation efficiency um, with our grass systems. And these can include things like moisture sensor based irrigation, um, subsurface drip. This is something that we're starting to do a little bit more work with in our research here in Logan at USU. Uh, subsurface drip for turf grass irrigation, which I think makes a whole lot of sense in a climate like ours because it keeps the moisture below the surface in the soil where the roots are below the surface so that there's not as much water loss to evaporation. So I think we're going to be seeing more and more of that. Now, there are also some integrated weather and irrigation systems out there. What you see there is an illustration of one with the controller. Um, and some local sensors that are uh, making some measurements to determine evapotranspiration. And then there are also community-based irrigation scheduling options. So um, I will talk a little bit more about those. Now, as I mentioned, we uh, are coordinating our messaging this year with the state's Division of Water Resources, and I wanted to uh, promote the work that they are doing. Uh, they have great resources online. These are a couple of websites I would encourage you to check out. In particular, the one on the right, this is the weekly lawn watering guide that is uh, put out by the Division of Water Resources. And this lawn watering guide is based on a uh, weather station network in the state. Um, I think I have a list. Yep. So these are the weather stations that they are drawing information from and then extrapolating for the entire state. So if I can back up again, they provide irrigation guidance by county. So I love this because I think it is a very straightforward, um, data driven way to schedule turf grass irrigation. So that's something that I would encourage you to have a look at. Um, and I would also encourage you to have a look at this website, utahwatersavers.com, because this is a website uh, where you can get, and this is for Utah residents. So those of you, I know there's some of you out there from other places. I suspect, I know I saw a few maybe from Colorado, perhaps Arizona. Most states in our region have support of this nature. Um, this, this particular program is one that we have here in Utah. Our legislature provided funding to uh, the state's Division of Water Resources for residents of our state to have rebates. Um, and the one that I'm particularly focused on today is rebate for smart irrigation controllers. Um, so if you're a citizen here, you can purchase a controller, get a rebate for up to $75 once you show that you have installed that, which is simply done with a photograph and submitting that on the website. But um, this is something I'm personally going to be taking advantage of this year. My irrigation controller, which was a very simple, straightforward, manually programmed controller, uh, <laughs> died last summer. So I need to get a new controller and I intend to take advantage of this uh, rebate program. So I would encourage you to have a look at that as well. Now, um, related, we have done here at USU some research on different climate, different irrigation controllers. So for example, uh, we've looked at climate-based irrigation controllers, such as the Weathermatic controller, um, this Rainbird controller, and a Hunter controller with some associated weather sensors. And we've also looked at Wi-Fi enabled controllers a little more recently, such as the Beehive, Skydrop, and Rachio controllers. 
And some of the, well, the idea in doing this research was to provide that information to the state as well as the Water Conservancy Districts to show whether or not these controllers were actually capable of, of saving water and of improving water use efficiency in our landscapes. And just quickly, what we found, depending on the controller, was water savings anywhere from 29 to 55% for the Wi-Fi enabled controllers and 35 to 51% for the climate-based controllers, as compared to the amount of water that a typical Utah homeowner applies. So that is a huge amount of potential water savings. So I think um, they are controllers that I often recommend. Um, I am going to be purchasing probably one of the Wi-Fi enabled controllers because I love the idea of being able to control that from anywhere in the world with my phone, as long as I have Wi-Fi access, internet access. So um, we know they work well, and I think there is huge potential for water savings with those controllers. And the nice thing is they take into consideration local weather information. And so irrigation is allowed based on local weather information, as well as the additional inputs you make as the property uh, manager. So what type of grass is it? Is it on a slope? Is it shady? Um, those types of inputs can be made. Now, another thing uh, that we have here in the state of Utah is the water check program. And this is a program that um, has been in place for over 20 years at this point. And the Center for Water Efficient Landscaping has been involved with it for quite a number of those years. And folks in the state can sign up for a water check. This is a web-based form you can use or the phone number you see listed there. And we conduct in-person water checks in all the locations that you see listed there, which of course, it's not the entire state, but it is a fair bit of the state. So if you see your area listed there, or if your area happens to be covered by Washington County Water Conservancy District or Weber Basin Water Conservancy District, this is a program uh, that is available to you. Now, if your location is not listed there, we do also have on the Seawell website guidance for conducting your own water check. So there are some calculations involved in conducting a water check, but we've automated that on the website for you. And there are detailed instructions on how to do this for, um, for yourself. And you can also get support in this through your local USU County Extension offices who have cups, like you see in the image on the right there, to loan you to conduct a, a DIY water check. So you may not have the in-person checks available in your area, but we do still want to provide support for conducting one of the water checks um, to you. And this is, this is a way that we're doing that. Now, we also have, as additional resources for the entire state, we also have fact sheets like this um, that guide you through conducting a water check and also give you a basic irrigation schedule uh, for wherever you may be in the state. So we have these for every county in the state. We also have them for some particular cities that are a little bit different. Hanksville, for example, has their own sprinkler uh, performance testing guide, but we have a number of these available to support you in um, conducting one of these tests. Now, um, I'm kind of getting towards the end here, but I do want to spend some time talking about turf grass dormancy. And I think it's really important that we all go into this growing season having a little better understanding of turf grass dormancy. I have sort of uh, whined, I guess I'm going to say whined, I have whined uh, to many of my colleagues about the trying to um, convey this concept has been probably the greatest challenge of my 20 year career, <laughs> I think. And I think it's because um, people don't necessarily understand the physiology of what's happening with grasses when they enter dormancy, which is fine. Um, but, you know, when I'm talking about it with folks, I like to compare it to what our deciduous trees do every fall. You know, our deciduous trees 
in our in the fall months in in our climate they drop leaves and uh, it doesn't mean they're dead though right you know those leaves turn brown or beautiful colors in some cases and they're dropped um, but the tree isn't dead it's simply entering dormancy to get through the winter months and so turf grasses uh, tend to follow a similar pattern and when we're talking about dormancy with grasses I mean what you're looking at here is actually a variety trial of different Kentucky bluegrasses, but you can see that some of them have entered dormancy and they're being subjected to drought, by the way. But some of these have entered dormancy and some haven't. But when this starts happening every year, I get a whole lot of panicked phone calls. And so um, I try to explain the, I, the concept of turf grass dormancy, how it's a very normal, normal physiological process. And it's something the grass plant does to protect itself for when conditions are better. You know, I get questions like, is this normal? Is this grass supposed to look like this? It's brown, it's yellow, you know, whatever the shade may be. Um, and so I do talk about this as a physiological process. Um, and I also talk with folks about determining whether it's dead or dormant. Grasses can die for sure, but much more often they're simply dormant. And so in order to determine whether they're dormant as opposed to dead, um, what I encourage folks to do is to perhaps pull up a plant or two and have a look at the crown of the grass plant. So in the image on the right, there's a, an orange circle and that circle is around the crown of the grass plant. So if you're trying to determine if it's dead or dormant, you can have a look at that crown. Um, if it's firm, if it is not papery and absolutely bone dry, it is okay. The grass is simply dormant and will improve when conditions improve. Um, the other thing that I definitely wanted to mention today, particularly in light of our drought declaration here in the state of Utah, is that grasses can survive on much less water than most people think. And as a minimum, a survival level of watering, as little as a quarter inch of water every two weeks can keep the crowns alive until temperatures are better, until moisture conditions are better. Um, now often, even though we don't have a lot of natural precipitation during um, our summer months in this part of the country, uh, we do often have at least that much, you know, perhaps a quarter or a half inch of water uh, natural precipitation per month. But if you're trying to meet that survival level of watering, that's going to translate to about 10 minutes of irrigation for spray, overhead spray irrigation, and maybe 20 minutes for rotor, which is going to be somewhat dependent on the type of uh, spray or rotor head that you have. But those are just some basic guidelines. And just that little amount of water is going to keep those crowns alive until conditions are better. So um, these grasses can absolutely be pushed. They can be pushed pretty hard in terms of water. Uh, and they will come back very reliably. And that, by the way, is particularly true for Kentucky bluegrass, which, although it will go dormant rather quickly, also recovers from dormancy rather quickly. Um, so I do have just a couple of thoughts I wanted to share on turf grass trialing programs, just so that you're aware. Um, you know, I firmly believe that we can have grasses in drought situations that can function well, but we do really need to focus on that proper management so that we are optimizing the water that we apply. Um, and selecting drought tolerant turf species and cultivars can help in that process. And in order for us to make good recommendations to you about appropriate species and cultivars, we conduct a lot, a lot, a lot of research in various trialing programs. So I did just want to mention that. Um, and the trialing programs that we do, not exclusively, but most of them really do consider drought. And we screen lots of species, lots of varieties for response to acute and chronic drought conditions. Um, those we then um, identify the ones that perform with um, the ones that perform better than others. We identify, and then with our cooperating partners, those then are chosen to enter the market um, and branded as superior cultivars. And we participate in this at USU. Um, here we are installing 
a trial a few years ago for the Turfgrass Water Conservation Alliance. This is during establishment, which of course we can't do a lot of weed control. So this may not look so good right now, but it ended up looking really, really nice. Um, another trial that we conducted with the Turfgrass Water Conservation Alliance, this particular one was looking at some different tall fescue varieties. But we also participate, let me back up, we also participate with a number of other programs, the National Turfgrass Evaluation Program, the Alliance for Low Input Sustainable Turf. And I just wanted to mention those because I'm fairly sure that most folks don't know the amount of work and research and effort that goes into improving grasses and reducing their water use and identifying varieties that stay green with less water. An enormous amount of work goes into that effort. And all of these programs essentially use digital image analysis to monitor how green these grasses stay over the course of imposed drought. So um, I like this image. It shows you by comparison, the difference between two varieties of Kentucky bluegrass. This is after 50 days without any water in uh, California. And the one on the left, that's mallard, Kentucky bluegrass, still had 38% green cover after that amount of time. Whereas the one on the right, which is Geronimo, had only 2% green cover. So this illustrates how different these varieties can be in terms of their water requirement and how well they perform under drought conditions. Um, just another piece of, of data to show you as it relates to these trialing programs. Um, here's that mallard Kentucky bluegrass on the left again. And compared to solar green all the way on the right, it had a 53% decrease in water required. So, you know, I mentioned the irrigation controllers and how the ones that we've tested could allow you to reduce irrigation by as much as 50%. But here is a similar decrease just by choosing a different variety of grass. So um, I think there's huge potential for identifying different varieties uh, for use. And we're very fortunate here in Utah that we participate in so many of these trialing programs and we're able to make recommendations for uh, varieties that do quite well here. So um, I've discussed some of the physiology around turf water use and the management practices um, and options for irrigation scheduling, uh, as well as some national trialing programs. Obviously, there is a whole lot of information out there um, when you're trying to determine how to irrigate and hopefully this uh, information I've provided will be helpful to you as well. And I want to thank you for your attention. And I also want to uh, draw your attention to the resources on the right there. Um, the Center for Water Efficient Landscaping website, the uh, USU Cooperative Extension website, the Utah Climate Center website, as well as our, our, our cooperating partner, the Division of Water Resources. And what you see there, the last three listed, those are some of the variety trialing programs that we participate in. If you would like to have a look, see some of the information, see some of the varieties that have been chosen. Um, and lastly, there my email and contact information. Okay, so let's start with species. Okay. Um, how, do you have any tips or tricks for folks to determine what type of species they have? I do. I'll give you just a couple um, for the most commonly used turf species that we see. So uh, with Kentucky bluegrass, you've got, of course, that dark blue-green color. Um, but if you look at, I hope this comes through okay on the video. <laughs> if you look at the tip of the leaf blade, it kind of looks like the prow of a boat. Does that look like the prow of a boat? <laughs> okay, so that is the leaf of Kentucky bluegrass. That's a good characteristic along with the color. Um, tall fescue can look really, really similar to Kentucky bluegrass, but if you run your fingers along the edge of the leaf blade, it feels a little bit rough. So that's a really good indicator for tall fescue. Um, perennial ryegrass is another one that is common, excuse me, commonly used, especially in mixtures with the other two. And it's got a super duper shiny 
back of the leaf. So those are just some quick quick tips for identifying different species. But um, I actually have a whole other presentation I could give you on this topic, because <laughs> uh, there's a, obviously a lot more than the three I've mentioned. But for those three, those are pretty good characteristics to look for. Great, that's very helpful. Um, a lot of you are asking about availability of this presentation after the fact. Um, it will be up on our YouTube channel. So I put that link into, into the chat box for you guys. Um, okay, do you have tips and tricks or guidelines for mixing species of grass? Example, can you mix tall fescue with fine fescue um, or, or would that be a mistake? Most definitely you can do that. In fact, I would really encourage that because the more you can mix, whether it's mixing species like tall fescue and fine fescue or varieties, like maybe several varieties of bluegrass together, the more genetic diversity you can have, the better. They've got different levels of drought tolerance, different disease tolerance, different pest tolerance. So, you know, more genetic diversity is just going to be better all the way around. Um, now, the person mentioned two, two different species that, that mix well together, but I also sometimes get the question, can I mix a warm season grass and a cool season grass? And um, the idea there is great because theoretically, you know, warm season grasses perform better in the heat of the summer and cool season grasses perform better more on the beginning and end of the summer. But the problem is that over time, one or the other tends to outcompete. And so they don't stay mixed, essentially. So it's not so easy to mix cool and warm season grasses, but you can certainly mix certain warm season grasses together and you can certainly mix cool season grasses together. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. We're getting a lot of questions on where people can purchase these varieties that you're mentioning, um, and, mm -hmm. and just in general, where do you, where do people go other than Home Depot to buy these varieties? Yeah, so um, uh, let's see. So on my last slide, I had the websites for the different programs we participate in, and that's where you can see some of the varieties identified. But we also have a, a USU Extension fact sheet on cultivars of grasses that we recommend. And on that fact sheet, we've got several seed suppliers listed in the state. And um, they are ones that you can contact about purchasing some of the recommended varieties. Um, do you know the name of that fact sheet? I'll throw it in the chat box for people. Oh, let me find it. I'll find it. Is it turf grass cultivars for Utah? That's it. All right, got it. Excellent. Okay, I'm gonna throw this in the chat box for you guys. I'll title it suppliers. Next question. Okay, so with cool season grass and letting it go dormant, how do you manage the weeds? How do you manage the weeds? Well, what we have observed in um, letting areas go dormant here in our research trials is that for a period of time, it's not really an issue. It can't, but it's an excellent question because if it continues over and over for season after season, um, it can become an issue. However, uh, just a general weed control recommendation we make is to do that in the fall is to do weed control in the fall. And so by that time, these grasses are typically recovering, temperatures are cooler. Um, we're often getting more natural precipitation at that time of the year too. And so it's absolutely okay to do weed control if you desire at that time of the year. So you're okay for a while, but it's a great question because if grass is weakened for a longer period of time, yeah, you can start to get some weed encroachment. Great. Yeah. Um... And just chatting about Bermuda grass, um, how do we change the statewide policy to allow Bermuda grass? Do you want to chat on that for a minute? Yes, I want to encourage you all <laughs> to contact your local county weed boards and make that request. I mean, right now in Utah, Bermuda grass is only officially allowed in Washington County, which is great. 
but it's just got huge potential here. And I understand why it's been on the noxious weed list because there was a time when common Bermuda grass, you know, and it still is a weed issue, but the new hybrid varieties of Bermuda grass are not weedy or invasive and they are so, so very drought tolerant and they just perform incredibly well under really hot and dry conditions. And so I would like nothing more than to see that changed, but it takes, you know, it's a county by county process. And um, I have been hearing recently that there's some movement being made on this topic, but aside from Washington County, as far as I know, uh, we can't officially use it yet in the state. So contact your county weed board, please. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> sure. um, what are your thoughts on artificial, or I'm sorry, do you recommend aerating turf? Yes, I recommend aerating turf if there's a compassion issue or a thatch issue. Um, I know that, uh, for example, if the soil texture is, is on the finer side, so leaning more towards the clay side of soil texture, those soils tend to compact more quickly. Um, you know, we get a lot of compaction on a college campus with foot traffic. You know, that's another area that you might want to consider aerating. Um, and it can help with uh, thatch because, you know, thatch, and I, I didn't get into aerating, although I did actually pull that out of the presentation before I gave it, but um, in the interest of time. But um, grasses have thatch, that's a normal thing. And it's just that when it becomes excessive, it needs to be managed. And we manage both thatch and compaction with aerification. And we recommend core aerification, either done in the spring or fall for cool season grasses. So I do recommend it. It can improve air and water movement. It can relieve compaction. It can encourage microbes to become more active in the soil and chew up the thatch that's there and get that to a more manageable level. So definitely, it's a, it's a recommended practice. Thank you. And I totally read that too fast and thought it said artificial turf. So I kept it with the species. I didn't throw it into maintenance. <laughs> um, so on that note, uh, what are some non-turf options that you that you like? And and can you maybe speak on clover, mixing clover in your lawn? Yeah, yeah. Um, there are lots of options out there. Um, so clover, it's, I have a graduate student right now who's working on mixtures of clover with grasses. And I've actually, it's funny, I've had that question recently from other folks as well. Um, I think that, you know, there was a time, it's like everything old is new again. And there was a time when we purposefully included clover seed with grass seed. And that was the whole goal with the idea being that clover, which can fix its own nitrogen, would do that and then provide some of that nitrogen to the turf. And I still think that that is a fine approach. Um, and in fact, we're looking at incorporating clover with grasses to just improve the overall ecosystem service and function of turf grass systems. So I think there's huge potential there. Um, and we're identifying which clovers work best, which seeding rates and so on, how they affect the, the um, nitrogen uh, use efficiency of the whole system, how they affect um, the carbon sequestration of the whole system. So that's something that I'm really very, very interested in from a research perspective and I think has huge potential. Um, I know that there are clover mixes out there that are sold to be straight clover, not including any grasses that can be good ground covers. But I would just, the only caveat I would add is that they don't withstand traffic. So if, you know, it so much depends on how you want to use the area. If you want to use the area for traffic, if you have kids who are playing or pets or what have you, a lot of the ground covers that I might recommend are not going to stand up to that. So that's where I kind of like the idea of mixing the clover in with grasses so that you kind of get the best of both worlds. Cool, great suggestions. Um, let's go back to mowing height. Okay. Um, there's a comment about uh, why, why does this person hear that folks recommend a short mowing for the first mow of the spring? Um, and then to add to that, also the last mow in the fall. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't really agree with the short mowing in the spring. 
Um, my recommendation is more to just, if you've got, I do recommend it though in the fall, definitely a short mowing for your last mowing in the fall. And the reason for that is that um, if you leave the grass really high at that time of the year, particularly if you're in an area that gets snow cover, then the snow falls and it kind of forces it to mush over like that. Um, and that can actually exacerbate potential disease issues. You know, one of the um, major disease complexes we get here is snow mold. And so grass that's underneath the snow bent over like that is much more susceptible to that. So um, that last mowing of the fall should be shorter so you can avoid that. But in the spring, I'm not so concerned about it. My, my personal approach really is I get out there and I just kind of fluff up the grass a little bit with a rake and I just get on with my regular mowing height. So definitely in the fall, not so much in the spring. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, with, with the mowing heights and the correlation to deeper roots, once you have those deep roots established, if you cut back on the mowing height, will the, what do the roots do? They also will shrink. They will shrink. So <laughs> I would say mm -hmm. keep it higher, <laughs> keep it higher. Good. I mean, you know, of course there's some practical considerations. You know, your mower is gonna have a, you know, uh, a limit. Um, there may be other reasons that you want to keep it a little shorter, but, you know, keeping it higher is going to encourage those deeper roots. And by the way, just from a physiology perspective, during the heat of the summer, even if you are mowing higher, there's going to be a natural decrease in rooting depth because of heat. So, um, you don't want to make that worse, right, by mowing shorter. Great, thank you. Um, first off, I want to congrat congratulate this person for doing a soil test. Uh, they're, <laughs> they're saying that their soil test came back uh, with high levels of phosphorus and potassium, and so they're reluctant to use a balanced fertilizer. Um, Good. Would there be an issue with using a balanced fertilizer, and what would the best suggestion be? There's not really an issue. It's just more that you don't need it. And um, so for me, I, and this is true of a lot of soils in our region, they tend to be sufficient in phosphorus and potassium. And so I really focus on nitrogen with turf fertilization. And there's different products out there like ammonium sulfate and urea and ammonium nitrate that are just nitrogen products. So if you can get a hold of something like that, then you're not applying something that you don't need. Now, in some parts of the country, they've started banning um, phosphorus in fertilizers because of the water quality issues that can sometimes result. That's not as much of an issue in this part of the country, but for me, I kind of look at it like this. Do I really want to pay for something I don't need? Not really. So I, you know, I really do focus on straight nitrogen products, but it's not the end of the world if that's what you have on hand and that's what you want to use. Great, thank you. Um, and how do how do fertilizers compare? Like, is IFA's nitrogen better than Scott's nitrogen? <laughs> uh, you know, it's kind of sixes. I mean, I, I full disclosure, I recently purchased IFA Step One for the first time, and uh, I went to the store kind of undercover. <laughs> 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 And I was talking to them about it. I wanted to hear what they recommend because I get a lot of questions about that. So it's like, you know, what is the nitrogen form in this? And is it quick release or slow release? And is, you know, I had a lot of questions. And um, that they were, first of all, I will say I was very impressed with the level of knowledge from the staff. Um, better than anywhere I've shopped before for fertilizer. I was, it was pretty amazing. Um, but in terms of, you know, the quality of the product, I think one thing that I actually kind of preferred about the IFA product is that it's got iron in it. And for our soils, iron, I, I mentioned during the presentation, iron can be a, a, a deficiency in our, with our soils. And so I liked the fact that it had iron in it. I liked the fact that it had... Um, uh, the the phosphorus and potassium were extremely low, so I'm not applying a lot of stuff I don't need. And I also like the fact that it had both uh, quick and slow release forms of nitrogen included. So um, 
You know, I, I wouldn't say one is necessarily better or worse than another, but I do, I guess I do think the IFA version is better because it's got the iron in it. And Scott's, they don't do that because, you know, they're selling their stuff all over the country. IFA is the Intermountain Farmers Association. And so they are more familiar, I would say, with our regional requirements. Great. Those are great points. Thank you. Yep. Um, and then just thinking about our soil and our heavy clay soil, there's a lot of products out there that claim to open up the clay soil or to help water absorb um, deeper into the soil. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts on those? Well, um, we've done a little bit. I mean, I'm not sure exactly what products you're thinking of. Maybe it's humates. Could that possibly be it? Um, we, uh, we have done a little bit of work with those here at USU. We had a student a number of years ago um, who did a research project with them and didn't find a whole lot of benefit to using those. Um, but, you know, as far as open, and sometimes their gypsum is recommended for that same purpose. Uh, but the, the thing of it is, is none of that lasts, you know, we didn't find an effect with humates, first of all, but even with gypsum and other products like that, it's not a long term fix. And so if you're trying to open up the soil that's heavy clay, I would say uh, my first approach would be to aerate you know, that is going to open up the soil. So I would aerate and perhaps incorporate some organic uh, matter. Great. Mm -hmm. um, and while we're talking about fertilizer, what are your thoughts on mulching your lawn clippings? Oh, do it, do it, do it, do it. Yes. Um, grass clippings can actually provide anywhere from one to two pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet over the growing season which would allow you to reduce your um, addition of, of, of separate fertilizers. Um, and the other added benefit is that the organic matter um, that's added with the clippings, you know, that over time will build up in the soil. And, you know, that's one of our challenges here in, in this region is our soils are so low in organic matter. That means they don't retain nutrients very well. They don't retain water very well. So anything we can do to improve that, such as returning clippings, is going to help over time. Great. Um, and then along those lines, so this person's had, they're having a buildup of clippings. Um, I'm assuming just on the surface that aren't breaking down. Okay. Um, that the blades might be, it says the blades might be starting to get thin. And then I've read that uh, gathering clippings can impede water and fertilizer from reaching the soil. Gathering clippings can impede water and fertilizer from reaching so, the soil. I wonder if they, first off, I have a feeling their blades probably aren't sharp. Um, yeah. Based on this question, but then would there, if, if the clippings, you know, gathered on the soil surface kind of work their way down, would that, would that in any way impede water or fertilizer from absorbing? Mm -mm, no, no, it wouldn't. It wouldn't. But I would say, you know, if that's a problem that you're having, see if you can mow a little more often so that the clippings are smaller, because the smaller they are, then they filter down and you don't see them so much. You know, that's kind of what I was getting at with that. Uh, you know, you want to mow high, but more frequently, if at all possible. And the other thing I would just add there, just as a general recommendation, you know, if you go on vacation and you come home and your grass is six inches tall, that is not a time to return the clippings because you are, you know, you basically can make hay at that point, right? So it's more <laughs> like, it's more like I better bail this stuff. Um, so, you know, you have, there are some practical considerations, of course, but when you're around and you can mow more often, yes, I definitely recommend returning the clippings, but mowing more often to keep them tiny. And you don't have to have a mulching mower, by the way, but just sharp blades like Candice mentioned. Great. Um, when you do that last mow in the fall, excuse me, are you gradually working down to that shorter height or are you just doing it all in one shot? Oh, I just do it in one shot. What are you doing and what should you do? <laughs> <laughs> that is a good way to put it because I, I kind of joke that my yard's a big experiment um, and it is. Uh, but I, oh, you know, 
sometimes if I feel like I have time, I might gradually reduce it. But more often than not, it's like, oh my gosh, it's the end of the season. It's snowing tomorrow. I better cut this. So I'm like down to the shortest, <laughs> I mean, like, like that. But you know, the thing of it is, is grass is so forgiving. You know, it, it's, it's really tough and it's so forgiving in so many ways. So even though I sometimes push it really hard, you know, by either cutting it really short or, or, you know, being really, really stingy with fertilizer. Yeah, I don't worry about it too much. I can always, you know, change what I'm doing and fix it later. Great. And then how often do you usually mow? Me? Okay. That depends on the time of the year. So there are certain things I'm kind of lazy about. Fertilization is one, and I definitely push it in terms of, you know, very low water application. But mowing, I love to mow. <laughs> It's very weird. I don't even care how many weeds are out there really, but I like it to be very even. So um, this time of the year, you know, for me, things are just starting to grow here in Northern Utah. And so, but I know they're gonna be growing more quickly and more quickly. So um, as we get into peak spring growing, I'm probably mowing twice a week. Then in the heat of the summer, that backs off to maybe once a week or a week and a half when it's really slow. And then in the fall, I'm back up to a couple of times a week. Great. Yeah. Um, all right, let's move on to some water questions. Um, so when you're installing drip lines in a flower bed um, or anywhere, is it, is it better to bury them below the soil line or to leave them on top of the soil and then put mulch or rock on top? So if it's a flower bed, I would say on top of the soil, but under the mulch, okay? Um, now, I mentioned subsurface drip with turf. That's a different scenario entirely. For that, we actually bury the drip lines. And we put them between four and six inches down, and we put them out in a grid pattern. So that's a different scenario. But if it's a flower bed or trees or shrubs, on the surface of the soil, but below a mulch layer. Perfect. Yeah. Cool. Um, and then question about watering during the day. Um, and maybe first off, just double check with your city ordinance because some cities just don't allow you to water Very during true. certain times of the day. But if you if that isn't an issue and you are watering during the day, um, is there any concern about the water sitting on the leaf tissue and then being burned by the sun? No. Okay. No, not with turf, not with turf. Um, and then do, does USU have any resources for people that don't have an irrigation system? Like they just move their sprinkler around the backyard. Well, uh, we have resources in the sense of, you know, what our recommendation would be with irrigation. So for example, I showed you those two simple sprinkler test fact sheets. Um, I would have a look at that. It gives you a good basic irrigation schedule which recommends irrigating half an inch each time you irrigate. And it gives you a schedule that changes over the course of the growing season. And so for someone, even someone who's irrigating by hand, you can still test to see how long it takes your, your sprinkler to apply half an inch of water. You can still do that. The concepts are the same. Um, it's just, you know, you're gonna have to move it around to cover the area evenly and meet the schedule that we would recommend. But the same concepts really apply. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Um, this is one of my favorite questions, maybe least favorite, love, hate, love, hate question. Um, so this person has shrubs and their lawn on the same sprinkler zone. Um, how, how do they manage this? Oh boy. Well, you know, you kind of, how do you manage this? First of all, that's not an ideal scenario. <laughs> Um, you know, the shrubs tend to have a different water requirement than the turf does, and then the trees do, and then all the other plant materials do. And so in general, we would recommend trying to separate those out. Um, you might consider, and I, you know, I'd appreciate your thoughts on this too, Candice, but, you know, I've seen some pretty simple um, sprinkler converter, I guess I'll call it a converter, conversion kits, where you can turn a regular sprinkler into a drip emitter by making an attachment and running spaghetti tubing. So perhaps that's something you could do with the shrubs to reduce the amount of irrigation that's going to the shrubs. But the issue 
will be that you've got a certain amount of pressure in that zone, water pressure in that zone. And so I think that might take some playing around, but otherwise I think you, you know, you kind of have to split the difference between the water requirements of the different plants. Um, yeah, yeah. It can get, it can get tricky and just, you know, buying a home that, that, uh, you know, the irrigation system was done and I, I've definitely made some adjustments, but I can appreciate that, mm -hmm. uh, that problem. And, and for me in my scenario, the easiest solution was just to take the drip out on all the shrubs and just water by hand when I need to, because it oh, okay. I mean, I may be watering those shrubs once every three weeks. They do get a little bit of overspray from the lawn. Okay. Um, so I guess just to add, I think it just really depends on your situation. Yeah, that's a tough one. That's a tough um, one. Okay, so here's a question on Wi-Fi controllers and scheduling them properly. Um, so this person said it, it didn't quite run, like they felt like it should. Um, just ended up doing things manually instead of using the weather station data. Yeah. Um, so their big question is, how do they customize their smart irrigation controller appropriately to utilize the, the smart features of the weather station? Well, one thing I would definitely encourage you to do is have a look at last month's webinar. <laughs> last month's webinar, um, we actually went over how to associate your Wi-Fi controller with with local weather data, how to find the right weather station and so on. So that's one thing I would say is if you can have a look back, I know Candace put in the chat the link to some of the previous webinars. So that describes how you go about that. And I'm not sure which controller they have, um, but depending on, depending on the controller you have, there are lots of inputs, right? So you are typically asked about your soil, you're asked about your uh, turf type. You're asked about the sun, the shade, the slope, the um, the distribution uniformity of your system, all kinds of questions. And that's where we have observed most of the issue is, is in setting all of that part up. So if you can get that part set up correctly, um, that's going to help a lot. And then associating it with as close a weather station as you possibly can is to your location that's also gonna help a whole lot. And then beyond that, I think if you were still having those issues, I personally, if it were me, and it will be me this summer, I'm going to be playing around with some of those inputs, the soil, the, the application rate of the sprinklers, et cetera, um, until it's functioning as best I can get it to function and still be very, very water efficient. So. I guess that would be my recommendation is to start playing around with some of those inputs. And if, by the way, this person who asked the question, if you're in one of the areas that's, that has a water check available to you, definitely take advantage of that because they're gonna give you that application rate information as well as the distribution uniformity information, um, which some of those controllers require. So, you know, that would be my first recommendation. Make sure that all of those inputs are as correct as they can possibly be. That should help. Thank you. Yep. Um, okay, let's take two more questions and then we will call it a day. Um, when you guys leave this webinar, there's gonna be a survey that auto generates. If you guys could leave us some feedback and if you're liking this sort of homeowner, um, uh, how to type of webinar and there's some more topics that you want to hear us touch on um, definitely leave us some comments on that uh, on that survey we can make that happen if there's enough interest okay so last two questions so during the 50-day drought study that you mentioned in California the first question is where was it conducted and do you know what the average temperature was so it was conducted in Riverside which is uh a very hot and dry part of California. Um, they never get as cold as we do here in Utah. So uh, super dry and hot. And wait, what was the other part of the question? Um, uh, average temperatures. Oh, average temperatures. Well, I know they get well over 100 on a regular basis in the summer. So if that helps. Great. I have a feeling they're trying to compare our location to their location. Yeah, yeah. So I would anticipate, based on the results I've seen there, that those would perform even better here in Utah. Cool, great feedback. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, and then final question: Can you overseed or uh, or reseed areas of your grass that are not doing well 
Um, and, and what is the best way to do that? Should you dig up the area? Should you just throw the seed down right on top of what's already there? So that, it, you know, it, it really depends on how much work you want to put in. I'll give you the very easiest way. Um, and this is something that we often do at our research farm. We will spray a turf area with um, a non-selective herbicide so that it's, you know, looking sad and dormant. <laughs> And we'll overseed directly into that. And we've had pretty good success with that. That is the absolute easiest, simplest way to go. Now, you can also go so far as to cut existing sod out. There are pieces of equipment, sod cutting pieces of equipment that you can use to do that um, and overseed then again into that area. But I would encourage you um, to definitely have a look at back at those establishment fact sheets that I showed. Um, if you are going to go that route, like taking it down to the soil. Another approach that we sometimes take at our research farm is um, we'll spray the area out with non-selective herbicide and then we'll use a rototiller to till it in. So we're tilling in that organic matter because as far as I'm concerned, that is a resource we don't want to waste. So we will till that in. We might rake out the bigger chunks of stems and stuff like that, but we leave that there because that's just adding organic matter to our soil. And then we go through the process of smoothing it and, and then we'll seed over the top of that. So there's lots of different ways to do it. You know, just um, uh, setting the existing turf back a little bit with non-selective herbicide and overseeding is the simplest. Awesome. All right. Well, Kelly, thank you so much for your time. Um, everyone that attended, thank you for your, your time and for all the questions and, and really making this a fun. Um, I had a lot of fun. I hope you had fun, Kelly. I did. Thanks for all the questions, everybody. It's always a lot of fun. Cool. All right. Everybody have a great day and we'll see you next month. Bye, guys.